great. I usually like to wait till we've got about 20 people on board uh, before we start. So SDA Q&A started out as a podcast about 18 months ago, and now it is uh, still a podcast, but we've been running it live from our Facebook group as well, which started off with only about 200 members, but since the start of this series that we began live, um, we've grown from 200 to uh, about 900 people in the group now, and it's very active. It's a private group, um, and I like the interaction that people have. People often comment, and uh, you may get some questions a little bit later as well. Um, but people often comment, and it, the thing I like about social media is that there can be ongoing conversation as well. So let me just pause for a minute. So I've got an edit point, and then we'll officially start. <coughs> Hi, and welcome to SDA q and I'm Peter Dixon, your host for today. And uh, with me today is Luke Ford. Nice to have you here, Luke. How are you? G'day, mate. I'm good. Uh, when we just chatted before we came online and I was running a bit late, so we only had a few minutes, um, I noticed you still have your Australian accent, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, actually, well, the more you talk, I can hear that it's uh, more of an echo of uh, your past than the current kind of... <laughs> um, currently with you all the time, so to speak. My wife's Irish, and she um, has... Uh, yeah, kind of a cosmopolitan Irish accent until her parents and sisters and brother all visit and then it becomes this very rich cork accent, very strong accent. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Luke. I thought we'd, we'd kick off before we talk about your experiences with Glacier View and your memories of that time. Um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about your adult life, kind of things that you've been involved with you did you ever officially leave the Adventist Church? Because I understand you've you know you've taken on some other modalities in your time. Tell us about if you did or didn't. Or um, I don't believe I technically can't... I was ever a, a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. I I was baptized by my father when I was sixteen. It was something that was important to my parents. And when you're a sixteen year old, you just go along with it. Uh, Till I was 18, I didn't really think there was any other way to live but, but Christian. But I don't believe I was ever officially a member of the SDA church. And, wow, I, I've, I've been, been back uh, maybe three times since I was 21. There have probably been three instances when I've walked inside a Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. Now 54. Right. And you're 54 years old now, yeah. Now you mentioned earlier too, because you were you did go to Avondale Primary School. Did you go to Avondale High School as well, or just primary? No, I went to Avondale Primary School. I left uh, midway through fifth grade. Then I came to the states, came to California, went to Pacific Union College Primary School, six, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, the school system's a little different in the states. And then I went to a non-Adventist evangelical Christian school for ninth grade and then from 10th grade on it was public school okay because you mentioned that um, you were in class with Gavin Hughes and uh, he, he's a very good friend of mine and he lives literally just um, two stones throws away from this actual studio right now so um, I'm due to catch up with him very soon um, now that the restrictions because of COVID are, are gradually lifting just double checking that we're in the actual group here. I'm getting a few comments from people saying that I may not be. So just hold one second. No, we are. So that's that's good. So um, do you have some other memories of some people you could just talk about from that time period? You were young. I remember leaving uh, Avondale Primary School halfway through grade five myself, actually, and we went to Fiji. And uh, But because of that moving, and it was such a, like uh, important time for me, I, I often reflected back and remembered, you know, Peter Lindsay and Phil Lindsay and the whole Lindsay family and Leonard Hoken and the Magnusons and... What about you? Have you got some memories of childhood friendships that you had there? Oh, yeah, I, I remember a, a lot of people. <coughs> I don't know if I, 
I want to actually drop names. They may or may not want to be associated with. Yeah, that's the, true. Uh, today, sorry, so I'm not going to. Sorry, Gavin names, Hughes. So. <laughs> sorry for mentioning Gavin. Then <laughs> he feels the same way. <laughs> but um, w- would you say that those years at the primary school were quite happy years? I think. Do you, Do you mind me asking when your mother passed? Yeah, my mother died before I turned four, so she died in April 1970, I believe. I would not uh, describe my years at uh, Avondale as happy. They weren't, they weren't dreadful, but uh, mm. my life didn't really work. And so I'll just give one, one little anecdote that kind of sums up uh, those years. My, my parents were very busy preparing for a lunch that they were going to have a lot of guests over. And so they just wanted me to stay out of the, the way so that they could do their work. I remember I sat in a chair and I just told myself stories for like two hours. And they were just so thrilled because I was completely out of their hair. I was out of the, the way. And I was thrilled too because I was having a great time. I was just like making up all these stories in my brain going on all these you know, wonderful adventures in my head. And uh, it was such a, a beautiful thing that I, I kind of stumbled into this technique for making all my problems go away. I could just start daydreaming. And that that time it worked amazingly. But uh, somebody doesn't want to find like some shortcut to make all their problems go away unless they're fundamentally miserable at heart. So I discovered all sorts of shortcuts over the next uh, four decades for making all my problems go away. But the reason that I was always looking for shortcuts to make my problems go away is because I was fundamentally miserable. Um, it's interesting, around that exact same time um, when I would have been associating with that same group of friends that you had, though we were a few years apart, um, there was quite a community there in Avondale of, of lecturers' kids, um, from the Patricks to the as I said, the Hokans and the Magnusons, and they weren't my, I'm generalizing just family names, um, and the Druers and the Lindsays, of course, and the Irvines. Um, and so I too had this mixed feeling because I was enjoying the cricket and the riding our bikes through the, the bushwalks and jumping off the swing bridge into the Dora Creek and that kind of thing. But often I remember finding myself going to sleep at night doing a little bit of what you are talking about there, not realising that around the same time you were probably trying to do it as well, just escaping from, um, and and for different reasons, no doubt, but links to Adventism for sure, where I would go to sleep at night worried about probation closing and this kind of thing. Did, did you suffer from any of those Adventist unique kind of things for those time, like worrying no, about the end of time? No, probation? Uh, I mean... Not very much. I'm probably exaggerating it. So uh, maybe maybe moderately, but I don't recall uh, any of that. I think from, from the earliest a- ages, my, my primary concerns were non-Adventist. Even though Adventist was the only, only thing I knew, all my friends were Adventist, and I didn't in, the, in those early years understand that there are any other ways to lead a life. None of my concerns were Adventist that I can recall. So I wanted to be a missionary, but that's just because I read so many amazing things about missionaries. And I I don't recall ever worrying about probation closing. Probably had a little bit concern about the the end of time uh, and Jesus coming back and having to flee to the mountains and and, a little bit, but I don't even recall it. I'm sure it had to be there mildly or or moderately, but my my primary concerns were with... uh, politics, with war, with, with things really, the power, things that are outside of Adventism. So I love to read books about uh, Winston Churchill and the American Revolution, American history. I love to read books about World War One, World War Two, the American Civil War. So I, I liked reading the Hebrew Bible because I liked reading about the battles that went on, King David, and th- those kind of uh, conflicts were interesting to me. But uh, I didn't have very many specifically Adventist concerns. Yeah, okay. So that's that's good in a way because um, I think you obviously have, you know, an inquiring mind and 
and not only were you able to kind of go into your own mind to maybe think about other things, you were able to research and read and actually understand a lot of stuff. Um, I think as a young boy, I, I took on way too much from the Adventist kind of thing. Um, can we just jump forward to adult? I'm just getting some more messages that it's cutting in and out. Um, well, luckily, I've got a clean audio on my end, so I'll be able to uh, yeah, email it to I, you I, it. Yeah, I do too. Um, but people that are watching, I've had almost everyone is saying that it's stopping all the time. Well, um, you can upload it later, so... That's right. Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, so just a note to everyone that is watching, I apologize that it's cutting in and out. We will upload it later on for everybody to watch a non-cutout model. But both both Luke and I have very strong Wi-Fi, good audio. So um, we apologize for that. And we will soldier on and um, we can we can upload it a bit later on. So, um, sorry about that. It's very annoying. I'm getting all these um, messages of, that it's throwing me a bit. Um, <clears throat> so, tell us a little bit now. We'll just leave that for a bit, come back to it. Tell us a little bit about um, you as an adult. So, you've, you've uh, tell us about leaving home, getting employment, uh, and how you kind of started exploring some other modalities Okay, so as a preacher's kid, so I think perhaps one reason why I, I perhaps did not suffer from you know, an excess of Adventist uh, concerns is because I was a, a preacher's kid and I had to listen to thousands of hours of my father's sermons. Oh, this is crucial. So I, I, would, I, I got hit quite a bit uh, as a kid. Um, I don't want to identify who don't need to point any fingers uh, but you know I got I got more than my share of corporate uh, punishment and so to try to avoid it I developed the habit of telling lies and so that the lies would get found out and so as a punishment I would uh, be, be kept away from my friends say over lunchtime and uh, I'd have to come home for lunch which royally sucked I mean who wants to come home from your mates you know to eat bloody lunch with you with your mum I mean that sucks and, but I had to do that for years. And then I had to read about 40 pages of densely written Christian apologetics every day and type a one page summary so that my dad understood that I understood what I had read. And so I probably went through 30 books of Christian apologetics in, in this regime. And I learned all the reasons rationally why Christianity was truth. And I viscerally, emotionally hated Christianity for taking me away from my mates, for you know, forcing me to read the, these dense books, having to spend, like while my friends were out playing, I was reading these bloody works of Christian apologetics and typing a, a one-page summary. This, this went pretty much through second grade through, through fifth grade. So I think that's where I developed a visceral hatred for Christianity. And I kind of took into my adult life, usually without even realizing it, just a visceral hatred for anyone who reminded me of my father, a visceral hatred for anyone who I thought abused religious authority. So my father never abused religious authority in the traditional ways that people think of. Like I'd, my father never came even close to any kind of sexual or financial misconduct. Uh, he, he, was, he was a very ethical man, but my father was a self-made man with a PhD in rhetoric. So he would just you know, blow you up over the dinner table or the breakfast table, like any kind of dispute he would use his rhetorical abilities to absolutely crush you. And he also was, was the man of the house, so I had to listen to thousands of hours of his sermons. So I was like thoroughly inoculated in his point of view on life and did not really like it. Now, until I was 22, I still regarded my father as heroic. And, and then at uh, age, age 21, I went away to UCLA and I came back nine months later, and instead of regarding my father as heroic, I regarded him as an emotional cripple. Now, my father did not change in those nine months. Obviously, I was exposed to a whole new ways of, of life. I was exposed to all these multiple points of view. I, I came to, I thought, what I thought were, were more profound uh, understandings of, of reality of my father. 
but uh, I never really shifted from that uh, realization that I had at UCLA at age 22. So I went there seeing my father as a heroic figure, and I came away from that experience seeing my father as an emotional cripple and uh, not wanting to do anything that would in any way repeat his life because I saw my father as being a fundamentally unhappy man, particularly after Glacier View. Uh, very lonely and unhappy. While prior to Glacier View, he would speak to hundreds of people <laughs> routinely. After Glacier View, he'd speak to a dozen or two dozen people. So he, he, we moved from living on Seventh-day Adventist College campuses, where you feel part of a community, to living a much more isolated, disconnected life. So I saw that the toll that my father's choices took on him, and yet, in my own bizarre fashions, I could not help but replaying my, my father's choices. So, so just as my father replayed some of his own choices in both uh, passionately joining a community, which he did as a, to join the Seventh-day Adventists at around age 15, and then passionately finding a way to get thrown out of the community in 1980. So I too would repeat this where I'd passionately want to join uh, some kind of community or connection, and then I would unconsciously find ways to destroy it and I would uh, continually feel the, the great pain of abandonment. But I had abandoned myself. I had created the conditions where I would continually feel abandoned. I would choose people who would abandon me. I would act in a way that uh, communities would want to be rid of me. And so I kept living out my, my father's pattern. I remember once I was asked to leave a particular synagogue, and I, I kind of doubled up in pain. And I, I said to the rabbi, I, I quoted from uh, the Bible, the sins of the father shall be, shall be uh, dealt upon the sons for a thousand generations. And the rabbi says that, that only applies if you, you continue the, the sin of, of the father. But uh, anyway, I just uh, kept, kept replaying situations where I would join, join communities and uh, find ways to destroy my life in those communities and get exiled from those communities. So I kind of kept replaying the worst parts of my dad's life over and over and over again. Wow, that's big. Did did you have knowledge that your father had repeated that kind of thing in previously? Um, was it a loop in his life? Or is it just that this, the, um, the way he went into Glacier View and was um, defrocked from the church... And you're suggesting that maybe subconsciously he was wanting to remove himself from communities as well. Did he have a, a paternal kind of uh, history from oh, his well, fatherhood yeah, he, as, father I mean, as well? He, he, and did he have other signs of doing it as well? Well, he had a father who abandoned him uh, pretty much. And he had a mother who was traveling all over Australia, chasing various men, having affairs with, with uh, married men. And so... He grew up deeply humiliated and ashamed of his mother. She was a horrible mother. His father was largely absent from his life, and uh, he didn't he didn't really have relations and normal level of uh, human connection. And so my father has never been fundamentally at ease around other people. the The way that he learned to deal with it is by preaching at them. He, he was always at his best when he was preaching. The larger the crowd, the better he was, the more human, the more open, the more vulnerable he was. But as far as like normal human interaction, he was fundamentally ill at ease unless it was somewhat of an equivalent uh, level of, of learning as himself. And if they could discuss either evangelical Christian theology or the health message. If my father could not discuss those two topics with someone of similar levels of learning as himself. So that would be, you know, at most a dozen people in the world uh, that, that were in his life. Or if failing that, then the only interest he had in human interaction was if he could preach to people. If you put him in a room where people were just chatting, he was just fundamentally ill at ease and would want to get out of there. Unless, unless he was the center of attention, he had virtually no use for human interaction. Um, so I, I'm not discounting that at all. I, I, that's your experience and that's, that's, 
that's valid. Um, we can only go by what we've experienced ourselves. Whenever I met him, and it was only um, face to face, I guess, on a few occasions, um, and maybe he, because he was older, um, that wasn't my experience. And I'm certainly not one of the people that would fall into the uh, academic equivalents or people on the same page with him health-wise. How, how much of that experience do you think um, others would have felt as well? And, how, and do you think there's others like me that actually had quite amicable discussions? Well, uh, l let's, let's just probe, probe your, your discussions with my father. How, how interested was he in your point of view? How deeply did he hear you? Uh, I think quite well, um, mainly because um, may maybe he was interested in my choices in life. Um, I was about to leave the church, I guess, when I first met him. I'd left the church when I met him again later. I'd met him as a young person. Um, so I can only go on my experience, and maybe that's more to do with... Um, this kind of maybe a laid back back vibe about musicians that kind of um, we're used to engaging with people in kind of different ways and maybe we we change their um, we can shift their focus unintentionally maybe um, but I, I would say he he seemed quite interested in in um, you know in in me and what I was doing and things um, and I didn't feel any hidden I think the interesting thing about humans is that we're multifaceted and, um, I, you know, I've got a six-year-old and a seven-year-old and I'm, I'm thinking, boy, what if down the track my girls, you know, like already I can, <laughs> I can tell that they get annoyed with me, um, you know, for various things. I, I wonder how much is, a, is someone's experience based on them seeing a certain facet of someone and therefore thinking that it's a bit duplicit. Um, I try very much to be exactly as I am talking to you, as I would to your father, as I do to my girls, as I do to friends. Um, but I'm an older dad and I'm, a <clears throat> I'm someone that's kind of perhaps used to speaking lots of people from lots of different walks of life. Um, but I... And I'm very lucky that my dad is the kind of person that you, what you saw is what you got. But I think maybe you're kind of referring to seeing a bit of two sides of, of someone perhaps and and that that's hard for a, a kid to see that, I guess, because that then forms a narrative for your life of I, I can't really trust the people that are closest to me maybe. Uh, I don't know what to say to that. I saw a man who was a preacher, and I saw a man who dedicated everything he had to preaching, and uh, and I, I I knew a man who was fundamentally ill at ease with other people, who whose favorite saying was uh, from Jean Paul Sartre: "Hell is other people." That was my father's attitude. He thought that other people were hell, with with a few exceptions. And uh, there were some people he loved. After my father died, I checked in with some of his uh, friends. So I wanted to see if there are other facets to my father that I didn't realize. And uh, I wanted to, to check what were the topics that my father loved to talk about, aside from evangelical Christianity and the health message. And yeah, my father liked to talk a little bit about politics, a little bit about philosophy, but uh, he had very narrow interests. And so unless really you shared with him uh, evangelical Christianity uh, or uh, the health message, he was not going to be able to sustain his attention very long. Um, I, think, I think what I was saying is that people that had, uh, I'm not saying he had multiple personalities, but, pe but people are both good and bad, like in your, um, not bad, but people are, have shades um in your experience with life you know you you know that people have those 
um, the, the public person, the person they are with family, the person they are with kids. Are you saying it's a bit like that or you're saying that what you saw is this is just who he was and um, that was not conflicting for you from that perspective? Uh, that the people are shades uh, is a truism, of course. Um, <coughs> so I, I don't really know what you're asking. I, I don't uh, talk about people as being good or people being bad. People are what they are. Everybody's a mixture of different things that different people... You talked about uh, how you try to be the same person with everyone you talk to. I, I think that's a delusion. You bring a different part of yourself to every person that you interact with. You are not the same person talking to your oh, wife for sure. as you are yeah. to your kids, to talking to your audience now, to talking to your mates in the band, to talking to your best mates from, from childhood, to talking to the grocer. You're going to bring completely different sides of yourself to all these different conversations. That's for sure. And that's why I use the word try. I know I don't succeed. Um, I have a mission in life to try and bring that down purely because of my girls. Um, one of the reasons I left the church was because I thought when the girls grow up, they'll say, why are you an Adventist when at home you obviously don't believe that? Um, so I've come late to life on this journey of trying to... Um, to, but but you're right. It's it's impossible. <laughs> They'll come to my my dying days and think, well, that was impossible. But maybe you know, you, you don't have to be that as well. But I think we all seek some kind of authenticity. I guess what I'm trying to dig into is is the narrative that formed your. You were saying that you'd you'd come into a situation where you were kind of connecting with people and you would try and um, sabotage it. I'm trying to work out if that's because of uh, an assumption you made or because of the experience you had. Is it a unique thing to your experience? Um, and I think, too, that your dad was um, a bit of a, a equivalent to a rock star kind of person. And a lot of, um, you know, from Mick Jagger to to any famous kind of person, they seem to often have kids that are reflecting the same kind of story that you're sharing. There's, there's a drive and a passion and a focus that, that the, um, the famous person has. And you're mentioning you know, you're a pastor's kid, but it's magnified if you're a famous pastor's kid, I wonder. Uh Sure. I mean, my father felt most alive when he was preaching in front of a large audience. When he'd get together with other e evangelists, they would talk about how many souls that they saved. For, for, for evangelists uh, like my father, uh, everybody they met was fodder for Christ. So they're, they're looking to save souls, to baptize people. Everyone they meet is just uh, fodder for, for Christ. So that's, that's kind of the, the price of the... Uh, profession so yeah my father was like the the equivalent of a, of a rock star in the, in the seventh day adventist uh, church so um he uh, he yearned for for that kind of status like no one accidentally becomes a rock star type of people mm. who become stars are people who yearn <coughs> for that degree of attention and mm. they do whatever it is that will bring them that uh, attention. So I was just reading a book on an Australian uh, doctor and academic. Her name's Claire Weeks. The name of the, the new book about her is The Woman Who Cracked the Anxiety Code. So she wrote these popular bestsellers on how to deal with your nerves. So the first one was published in 1962, <coughs> Self-Help for Your Nerves. Anyway, she received a lot of acclaim in Great Britain and in the United States of America. And she was kind of bitter that she didn't get the same acclaim in Australia. So she gave an interview talking about how this was just a visit that she was on to Australia, that uh, in Britain and the United States, they gave her great acclaim, but in, in her own country, she, she didn't really matter. And uh, she was being very, very human there because people grow towards the sun. People angle towards wherever they are best liked wherever they receive the most adulation 
love it, love and care. Uh, mm. So my, my father was the same way. He he got the most adulation for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Compared to doing that, nothing else would bring him one one hundredth of that adulation. So therefore, he oriented his entire life to preaching that which brought him the most adulation. Now, this isn't unique to my father. This doesn't make my father a bad man. My father grew up without a functioning family. So he didn't learn how to relate to people very comfortably. So, I mean, this this applies to, to rabbis as well. There was a rabbi who survived the Holocaust. His name is Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg. Uh, Orthodox Jews know him as the three to ish. And uh, when he survived the Holocaust, he was thinking, okay, wh where will I go now? And he couldn't go to any of the major Orthodox Jewish institutions because if he went there, he would become the number one guy. And the guy who is currently there, who is number one, would not want to be supplanted to be number two. Now, some people might think, oh, rabbis, they're, they're beyond ego. Or, you know, preachers of the gospel, they're beyond ego. Or, mm. you know, truly dedicated priests, they're beyond ego. Well, that's nonsense. They're filled with ego, just like plumbers and air conditioners and musicians and uh, TV performers. So none of the rabbis who are number one at their institution wanted to be supplanted by this guy who just survived the Holocaust. At the same time, this guy who just survived the Holocaust, he would not go anywhere where he would be number two. So he ended <laughs> up going to this very tiny community in Switzerland, Montreux, Switzerland, where there are only about 20 Orthodox families because he would be number one there. And yeah. so this isn't unique to my dad. This isn't unique to Rabbi Weinberg. This is pretty much the rule of human nature. People grow towards that which gives them the most love. I agree a hundred percent. I agree. Uh, I can I can see that even in my own life, where you you um, you know you try different things and and being a one thing I learned early on as a young man, I I wanted to make a living as a musician. And uh, pretty soon I realized that to make a living as a musician, um, I'd be doing weddings, bar mitzvahs, <laughs> parties, anything to survive. Um, and so I do understand the you, you gravitate towards the light, particularly if you're trying to kind of put food on the table. Um, it's a human condition, isn't it? And, and I don't, I'm not saying that you are thinking your father is unique in that way. I'm trying to work out if it's unique in the way it has affected you it, in that if you're the son of someone that is in this, you know, manifesting this kind of, um, um, would you call it a personality type or a human condition or more magnified than the average person, does that affect their children more than it affects a family where the, the father's not um, like that. It's interesting. I converted to Orthodox Judaism a couple <clears> of decades <throat> ago, and uh, there's no such phenomenon as rabbi's kids. So growing up Adventist, you certainly knew about preacher's kids. They were much more likely yeah. to be rebellious. Uh, there's no such uh, phenomenon with uh, rabbi's kids. And I, I think what, what's... Uh, what has far more effect on both my life and on my father's life and on your life and on the life of the person who's listening right now uh, are the genes. So uh, people are born with certain genetic uh, predispositions. There, there are five basic uh, tests for, for personality, whether someone's like high in agreeableness or low in agreeableness. Well, both my father and I are low in agreeableness. We don't just go along to get along. We're quite happy to stand apart from the crowd. Uh, neuroticism. So pretty much anyone who converts to a new religion is going to be high in neuroticism. So neuroticism means that you love to experience uh, negative feelings, that you love to bathe in them. So both my father and I converted to a new religion. We both uh, quite well above average in neuroticism. Then uh, conscientiousness. So I'd say my father and I are kind of average with, with regard to conscientiousness. And then I'm trying to think, what are the, oh, openness to new experience. So both my father and I are probably high in openness to new experience in that we both like uh, learning and uh, we both converted to, to a new religion. And uh, there's one other, but I th big five personality, let me just look it up. So yeah, we, we all have these uh, 
yeah, extroversion or introversion. So um, I think both my father and I were kind of even, uh, even there between extroverted and introverted. So you're saying <clears throat> that with the, the, you know, it's like a, a Swiss army knife. We have these genes within us and the certain um, blades and whatever are going to come out. Um, and maybe that if we have a certain combination, that's going to affect us a little bit more than, uh, than other combinations in a, perhaps a detrimental way. I, I, it's not a necessarily about detrimental or not detrimental. We're just born with predispositions and we essentially become who we're genetically programmed to be. So let's say I was, let's say I was raised in a Roman Catholic home. <coughs> or if I was raised in, in a uh, secular home, well, religiosity does tend to be environmentally induced. So I've lived pretty much all my life in a fairly religious uh, community. So that is environmentally uh, produced. But uh, predispositions, uh, personality predispositions, those are just hardwired in. So you'll find if you look at identical twins raised apart, that they tend to have very similar life outcomes. They'll s tend to like the same food, the, the same movies, they'll tend to dress the same way, they'll have the same personality types. So all, all, all these basic uh, personality traits are essentially hardwired in via genetics. Now, some things are environmentally caused, and uh, that's, that's religion, for example. I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and I, I was predisposed to living a, a highly religious life because that is what is normal to me. Is that why? So, so you just on the not not detrimental. You're just saying this is just how it is. Yeah, this is just how it is. This, these are the cards you were dealt. This right. is the life you've lived. Yeah. Um, I tend to agree. I, I I'm the kind of person that thinks the environment has less of a role to play in our story than um, than the genes do. We uh, we dealt certain cards, and I see it in my girls again. I keep referring back to them because it's been impactful being an older father um i can see them reacting in certain ways that i thought had been ways that i'd learned to react and they're just reacting identically without seeing me exhibit those kind of certain anxieties and things that that exactly what i had as a little boy um so yeah i agree with you on that and and you're saying and i think um if people have said to you because um, I know when I said I was going to interview you, some people have said, oh, you know, it might come across as a bit negative towards your dad. But I think what I'm trying to tease out is that I, you're not actually being negative to your dad. You're saying this is the, the cards he was dealt, these are the cards I was dealt, and there's a certain cause-effect response to, to how your life unfolds after you've been given those cards. Would that be a little bit yes, closer? Yes, uh, exactly. Like my... You think my father chose to be fundamentally ill at ease with other people? No, no way. That's right. Did you think he, he liked that? You think my, my father liked that uh, he was so predisposed to create a schism everywhere he went? You think he enjoyed that, that strain? You think my, my father enjoyed having sleeping problems since his 20s, uh, hardly ever getting a decent night's sleep since his 20s? Do you think mm. he enjoyed that? Do you think he enjoyed all the, the tension that was, you know, in him and around him and uh, constantly dealing with people who are angry at it? Do you, do you think he enjoyed that? No, he didn't. He didn't choose mm. that. He didn't choose to be schismatic. He didn't choose to be a stirrer. He didn't choose to be ill at ease with other people. He didn't choose to be someone who couldn't relate to his sons. Like that mm. was a great pain to him that he could not relate to his sons that yeah. he was racked by guilt that he was a bad father. He, he, was, he felt terrible that he didn't have any relationship with his two sons. He didn't choose that. that it wasn't his fault. He, he had no modeling for how to be a father. Like considering yeah. where he came from, he, he did a, a damn good job. I, I was raised with a very clear sense of right and wrong. Uh, I, I was raised with an encouragement to follow my, my intellectual interests. Uh, I was raised with food on the table. Uh, I never went hungry. I never went lacking. I, I never saw my father stray either sexually or financially. My father was an upright, uh, righteous man. He was an excellent role model in, in, in that department. And my father's shortcomings were overwhelmingly not things that he, he chose to inflict on himself anymore. Mm. Do you think I chose to be a sex addict? 
You think I chose to be a porn addict. You think I chose to be a debtor. You think I chose to be an under owner. You think at age 54, I chose to be a bachelor. You think at age 54, I chose to never have any kids. You think I chose to keep getting thrown out of communities. You think I chose to go through enormous periods of isolation and self-loathing. Mm. You think I chose to spend my 20s in bed. No, I didn't choose any yeah. of those things. And mm. nor do I beat myself up that uh, th there was one time when I directed a porn movie. I, I don't, you know, I don't beat myself up every day. It's like, oh my God, Luke, you, you directed a porn movie. Therefore, you're a horrible human being. How can mm. you ever look anyone in the face? No, I, I don't beat myself up because I directed a porn movie. I don't beat myself up because I was sexually promiscuous for a few years. I don't uh, beat myself up because I uh, used women for a period. I, I don't deny it. I, I try to make amends for all the things that I've done wrong. I, I don't beat myself up for having a schismatic uh, personality like uh, my father's. I don't beat myself up for having very strong narcissistic tendencies. I didn't choose those. I didn't choose to, to be a wanker. I, I didn't choose to be a hateful person. I didn't choose to be a lonely person. I didn't choose to be someone whose life would, would seem pathetic from, from many different angles. My father didn't choose to, to have a life that from certain angles would look uh, pathetic. So it all depends on the angle that you use to approach either my father or me. So from a certain angle, my father looks like the most righteous, heroic, godly man who ever walked the earth after Jesus. You know, absolutely with fidelity to the facts you can, you can look at my father and see this is a wonderful man. This is a great man. This is a, a rock star of, the, of his, his community. Equally with the fidelity to the facts, you can look at him and say, oh, this is a sad man. This is, was an emotionally broken man. So you can, look at, you can look at me, you, everyone with complete fidelity to the facts. And just depending on the angle, uh, mm. it can be flattering or it can be embarrassing. It can be pathetic or it can be inspiring. Mm. Yeah, I I hear you. I um and I think it's I think it's admirable that you're like I'm trying to be that kind of authenticity and and the way you've just spoken there shows that you're achieving that kind of authenticity. You're you're speaking your mind, you're facing your demons, you're accepting yourself as you are, you're you're acknowledging that the cards you were dealt helped to kind of create this narrative of your life with its ups and downs its ebbs and flows and you're examining the human condition and um, I think one of the the things that's shining out is you're not saying you're a victim right. I, I really don't like when I hear people say well this is the the cards I've been dealt and then they start blaming everyone else you're you're highlighting a human condition and then grappling with how to to live your life in a world with humans that have all these conditions including yourself yeah there, there's nothing i've done that's more embarrassing than directing a porn movie that that's the most socially embarrassing thing that i've i've ever done and you can tell when someone has dealt with something if they can talk about it without their voice breaking without their voice getting strangled without their voice getting tight without their body language changing without them physically collapsing without them getting tighter and uh, getting all these distorting tension patterns. So that's how you can always know if you've uh, dealt with something. Can you talk about it? Particularly, can you talk about it publicly? So like I can talk that uh, I'm 54 and I've never had a romantic relationship lasting longer than a year. So I can talk about that without my voice going all weird because I've worked that through. I can talk about I, I didn't really have a relationship with my father the last uh, 30 years uh, of his life. And I can talk about that because I've, uh, I've worked that through. I've had uh, 10 years of therapy. I've had uh, 10 years of various 12-step uh, programs. So if, if you encounter a topic and then your voice starts cracking and changing and you get these weird tension patterns on your face, then, then it's something that you haven't dealt with, and that's a gift to you. Then, you. then you know that you've got something that you need to deal with. But if you've mm. worked something through, if you've done the bloody work, then you can talk about anything. I don't need to be, <clears throat> pretend to be anything that I'm not. I don't have to try to make you believe that I'm a good person. I, I have mm. no need to convince you that I'm an upright man. 
I don't need you to follow me in anything. I don't need you to take my perspective on my father or on the Seventh-day Adventist church. It, it, it doesn't matter to me. Mm. That's, that's the ultimate freedom, because you, you um, get to be yourself. A lot of people go to their graves living a life of just acting. Exactly. Um, and, and I acknowledge that that's also confronting to, to some people. I won't mention a name, but there's someone that we, that we haven't mentioned um, that was around Kurumbong around the time you and I were, were um, young kids. And I ran into him the other day, and um, he had that kind of um, ability as a young boy to to be that he would just say stuff and be really you know the the cards that were dealt to him afforded him the luxury of just um and and when i saw him at bunnings you know and he's he's a grown man now he'd, he'd be 56 something like that and he's just exactly the same he looks young and light-hearted and um <laughs> so i kind of felt a bit of envy um but it kind of highlights that we, in many ways, all of us want to get to a point where we can be true to ourselves, we can be ourselves to others, because it does give us that sense of freedom. And I certainly don't want to go to my my grave, especially with the people closest to me, um, just realizing that my life was an act. But a lot of people don't have that kind of um, desire to to um, search for that kind of very raw freedom. Why do you think that is? Well, gosh, uh, when people, oh, people don't want to change because doing this kind of work that I was just talking about is very, very painful. So people don't want pain. So people will keep doing what they've always done until the pain of continuing to do that <clears throat> exceeds the pain of what it would take to change. So. People, for example, don't usually enter psychotherapy or, or take it seriously until their 40s, at least, until they've been broken by life. Only when people encounter collapse, only when people essentially collapse, when, when their way of doing things doesn't work, do, do they then uh, think about changing. So my father, for whatever his flaws, he, he never reached uh, collapse. He, his way of life worked. And you can argue with my father, you can detract from my father, you can say he was wrong about this or that, but he had fundamentally a way of living that worked. And uh, I did not have that luxury. I did not have a way of living that worked. And so from the earliest age, I was always looking to escape from life. And do you think people lack a courage to change because there's something genetically wired within us to conform to the group. And if we look if we look like we're kind of admitting weakness, admitting shameful things that we like demonstrably can be uh, ostracized from the group. And it seems when you when you analyze sociologically and anthropologically speaking um, how societies and humans function with each other, I've just listened to the book Sapiens. And it's fascinating. It seems to be genetically wired within us to toe the line, not try and look uh, like we're kind of presenting our true selves to the rest of the group because it's important for those groups of mammals to huddle together and survive. Do you think that plays a part in, in what we're talking about? Yeah, that, I mean, your, your relationships with other people it essentially equates to your, your success and happiness in life. Your happiness level is measured by the quality of your relationship so i speak to you now with the with the understanding that uh, the whole world could hear it meaning particularly my my religious community i primarily live my life within orthodox judaism so i i do 20 hours a week of live youtube shows but when i'm doing a show i do it with with the the, the mindset that everybody knows everything so i used to always try to get away with stuff this is kind of a recent development in my life so i was always thrilled to see how much I could get away with. And that approach to life did not work. So now I'm embracing the attitude that everybody knows everything. So I'm not speaking to you in a way that I'd be ashamed to have heard by everybody that I could meet in life 
from my Uber driver to clients, to potential employers, to co-workers, to uh, girlfriends, you know, the potential, you know, mother of my children, you know, if she's, she's out there, if I be, to be so lucky or, you know, whatever professional personal opportunities come along, uh, I, I approach this microphone and I approach my life with the attitude that everybody knows everything. Yeah, that's good. And, and that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm aspiring to be as well. Um, uh, what I'm saying though, is in a genetically speaking, because we're talking about cards that are dealt to us. Um, most people don't do that. Most people don't get to that point. And I'm saying that it, when they, when they don't, is it valid to call them out on that? Or is that no, no. I mean, they're not going to. They're not going to be able to hit you. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no reward for taking other people's moral inventory. It's not going to help them. Uh, no one's going to go. Oh, you're right, Peter. Boy, I'm so glad you pointed that out. That's <laughs> never going to happen. happen. They're just going <laughs> to hate you. Uh, I learnt a long time ago that um, no one wants your advice, <laughs> and that's where the the uh, the story of you know shooting the messenger comes from because so um yeah i i get that um i i'm i'm just saying that it, i think it's the norm though it's the norm for people to keep their head down to pursue the things that will make them appear to be courageous and um shining examples of being a pillar of the community and it, I think it's wired within people to do that. Do you, why? Why do you think um, your path has been a bit different to that? Why is my path potentially trying to be different to that? Oh, it's it's a combination of uh, genetics and environment. And then, if you have a, a religious point of view on life, then you believe that there's free will. But if you're not religious, then it's just genetics and environment. But even if you are religious, then genetics and environment play play a huge role. And I'd have to say, like looking back on my life, I, I think that my my freedom freedom of will was considerably more constrained than I experienced it at the time. So, as I speak to you now, I feel you know, complete freedom of will to to say anything. I feel completely free. But when I look back uh, on my life, I see that my options were considerably narrowed by the combination of my genes and environment. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, it you're a bit of a conundrum to me in that uh, you, you're you presenting uh, um, uh, this, and this is not a judgment, it's just like, it's just interesting that you're presenting a really profound awareness of uh, anthropology, so sociology, genes, how mammals kind of live and where they've come from and how they cope with with life but you've also found yourself a modality that is a spiritual modality and i don't really know much about judaism at all um how do you marry those two together like do you think that some people who are having the awakenings and the life that you've had often become more agnostic or atheist as they go down the path um, how is it that you have found solace within a, another religion? Okay, so I, I turned to Judaism because I thought uh, it was divine truth and because I also thought that it helped my life to work. Uh, but uh, in the final analysis, all the demons that, that I thought uh, converting to Judaism would deal with it didn't deal with any of them. None. Zip, zero, zilch. My fundamental problems of, of poor moral character my fundamental problems of selfishness, self-seeking, uh, dishonesty, uh, overwhelming fear, lack of consideration, all these, these prime character defects were not affected at all by my conversion to Orthodox Judaism, my sex addiction not affected at all, my love addiction not affected at all, the, the reckless uh, way that I did all sorts of things in my life not affected at all, my constant desire to escape uh, from reality to take a shortcut from my problems, uh, not affected at all. 
So the way that I deal with these different modalities is to recognize that they each have their place. Orthodox Judaism is a wonderful way of life. I'm very happy to have converted to Orthodox Judaism. I feel very much at home, very uh, comfortable and, and pleased with belonging to the Orthodox Jewish community. But uh, don't seek more from Orthodox Judaism than it can give you. If I wanted to deal with my porn addiction, I had to go outside of Orthodox Judaism. And so I went to therapy. And guess what? Therapy didn't even shift it a tiny bit. My inability to earn money not shifted at all by 10 years of therapy. So I had to start going to 12-step programs. But I don't look to say 12-step programs for truth about biology. So if it comes to biological truths, I want to hear from biologists. If it comes to historical truths, I don't want to hear from rabbis or pastors. I only want to hear from trained historians from elite <laughs> universities. I, I yeah. don't even want to hear from historians from the University of Wollamaloo. I want to hear from people who went to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, or Berkeley. If it comes to economics, I want to hear from someone who is trained from an elite university in economics. If it comes to music, I want to hear from a musician. If it comes to spirituality, uh, generally speaking, I want to hear from someone who's had uh, addictions like mine and, and overcome them. If it comes to psychology, then I want to hear from an elite uh, psychologist. So I don't seek more from any modality than it, it can give. Yeah, I love hearing that because you're not saying um, that you're joining the ranks of something to fix all your problems and then turning around and proselytizing everyone to that. Well, look what it's done to me, like a lot of people do. You're actually just saying, you know, maybe you thought that was going to happen and then it didn't happen and you still had all these um, issues that you were dealing with. So why not go to the specialists uh, that can help in regard to the all the different areas that you've talked about that makes sense to me yeah yeah um, you'll know if your approach to life doesn't work you'll get humiliated so if yeah. you're not getting humiliated your approach to life works if your life is smooth if you feel like you're gliding through life i feel like i'm gliding through life for, for several years now mm. I, I can't even remember the last time i was humiliated so mm. it seems like my approach to, to life which is not something that i came up with but that I've borrowed from other traditions and other programs, it seems to be mm. working. But as soon as I start getting humiliated, then I'll know that uh, I need to change my, my approach. Change the tack a bit. Yep. So, so what is it about Judaism that, um, like, like I, totally am, I, I totally agree, and, and I, li I love that idea. Like I, I love the idea of going, you know what, I've got the problem here. I'm going to go and really talk to people that can help with that. Um, why? What? What is it that draws you to Judaism? What? What? What is it doing to um, bring you that that important ingredient that um, you might have been missing without it? Okay, so I, I told you that I never really had much of a relationship with my father. So I've lived my whole life seeking out substitute uh, father figures. And I was often closer and more interested in talking to my mates' fathers than I was even my mates from, from school. And uh, eventually I encountered this uh, Jewish talk show host in Los Angeles named Dennis Prager, who became oh, a huge yeah. uh, father figure uh, for, wow. for me. Uh, I've just watched lots of his um, YouTube clips. Yeah. So, yeah. so I was seeking a father figure and uh, Prager became a, a father figure. And then... Orthodox Judaism, on top of that, became even more of a father figure. It's a very uh, patriarchal religion, so it just uh, spoke to my soul. And then the uh, second thing that drew me to, to Judaism, which in my head was primary, this father figure thing I didn't fully understand till later, but in my head what was primary is that I was always looking for a way to make a better world, and so I thought that Judaism was a step-by-step -step detailed system for making a better world by morally improving people through a system of action. Judaism is a religion primarily focused on action rather than on belief. So that excited me. And now just uh, living in Orthodox Judaism, what I love is that there's very little emphasis or concern with how you believe. So I don't recall ever having a rabbi ask me what I believe about God. Instead, mm -hmm. I've had rabbis ask me, if I needed a job, if I needed a doctor, did I have a good place to live? 
Did I have a place to eat for Shabbat? Was I taken care of for Rosh Hashanah? Was I looking looking for a shidduch, a, a match? So those were the things that uh, rabbis would talk to me about. I love that. It's so mm. practical. And you can mm. you have such a wide range that you can believe or discuss. You know, I could dis- if I want to discuss something, I can find people in Orthodox Judaism to discuss it with. I can talk to Orthodox Jews who are atheists. Now, not many, yeah. but there are some. Yeah. Uh, I can talk to Orthodox Jews who are into evolution. I can talk to Orthodox Jews who are fascinated by the alt-right. I can talk to Orthodox Jews who are fascinated by English 16th century literature. Like anything that I want to discuss, I have Orthodox mm. Jewish friends that I can talk to about it. And mm. so I love the intellectual openness of my Orthodox Jewish friends. You know, we can sit around and talk about, okay, if there's a God, if there's not a God, what are the implications for this, for that? It's uh, nothing is off the table. Now, I'm not saying with every single Orthodox Jew, I can talk about every single thing. No, there are some people I can talk to about X. There are one or two people I can talk to about Y. There may be three people that I can talk to about C. There may be six people I can talk to about D. And so yeah. I've become in my old age much more sensitized to who I can talk to about different topics, but I can pretty much take care of everything that I want to talk about. I can find it within my Orthodox Jewish community. Mm. So that's that a damn good great. way to live. Sounds great because um, you're, you're finding a sense of camaraderie mm-hmm. there. And uh, since leaving the church, I've struggled with finding camaraderie because I have many friends within Adventism and from outside of Adventism and within the music community that I can actually uh, discuss all of the topics you just mentioned and know that I'm still very much uh, appreciated and not judged and cared for. Um, Sorry, are you there? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Just keep going. Just taking care of something. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So, yeah, and I think what I miss is that there's something about, like you're using the term Orthodox um, Jew, it's it's nice to be able to put an umbrella around the variety of people that you can talk to and find that camaraderie with. Um, I know that with my various groups of friends, I can't put an umbrella around that because some are still Adventists, some are atheists, some uh, you know musicians that uh, you know might be into uh, the Rastafarian lifestyle or the New Age lifestyle, whatever. But within all those different groups, I I find people that I can connect with, but I can't put an umbrella over it like you've been able to do with um, with uh, having a, a group that you find that connection with that are actually called Orthodox Jews. So maybe what I'm trying to find is is um, a, a name for the, the group of friends that I kind of connect with in a way, because that kind of helps to draw attention to the camaraderie. Yeah, Orthodox Judaism is a way of life. So there are certain certain codes that you, you need to live by you live by those codes, then you're part of the community. You violate the codes, then you're outside the community. So that's, that's how I roll. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it makes sense. Um, and like you say, what, what works for you where you're finding yourself in situations where you're feeling uh, a lower level of, um, um, Oh, what was the word you used before? Um, where you're uh, not shamed. Um, oh. Can edit this pause out later. Not humility. Not vilified. Not shamed. What was the word you used before that you seek? As soon as someone finds that they're getting the levels of that rising, they should. Oh, take humiliation. Them up. Humiliation. Exactly. Yeah. As long as you're not <laughs> yeah. getting humiliated, then your life probably That's works. right. You're not. Yeah. And so that works for you. And that's, that's yeah. great. And uh, I think on my journey, in, I, I, instead of trying to join um, an official group, I'm just trying to find a collection of people that have a like mind and, and it'll be a fairly small group. 
but um, I, I've got people that I know that I can contact and have coffee with and, and share. You know, I can talk about Sam Harris and the idea of do we actually have freedom of will, and I've got others that I probably wouldn't talk about that with. Um, but they are still under a collection of, of my friends. Uh, and, and you've maybe found a bigger collection that you're calling your, your group, your comrades. Would that be true? I mean, I don't know if it's bigger or smaller. I, I belong to a tribe. And so yeah, okay. not, not everyone in a tribe is born into it. Most people are, but occasionally tribes adopt outsiders. And I was lucky enough to be adopted by this tribe and I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, cool. Now, the, when uh, your, your dad kind of has had a tribe grow around him, like people were even called Fordites. <laughs> um, so let's just jump back to Glacier View. You're a young boy. What, what um, cognizant memories do you have that you can share about the actual build-up to Glacier View? Maybe were you aware of the, the famous forum meeting where... Yes, your dad, your yeah, dad yeah. I attended the, 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 and... the meeting, that, uh, the forum meeting, I remember there was a lot of excitement uh, about it. Uh, my, 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 my mother and meaning my stepmother and my, my father were cognizant that this was going to be a big deal, that uh, my father was going to uh, blow up some of the, the traditional uh, teachings of, of the church. You felt the excitement in, in the air. I was there and uh, I stuck around for, I think, the first like 90 minutes of my father's lecture. Then during the Q&A section, I was just outside the, the meeting, you know, hanging out with, with people. But uh, yeah, I felt the excitement in the air. And then shortly thereafter, my parents moved to Washington, D.C. so my dad could prepare a defense of his views. Thank God they, they were persuaded to leave me behind to finish eighth grade with my mates at Pacific Union College. I, I loved that Pacific Union College Adventist community in Angwin. California Adventism is a whole different thing from Australian Adventism. So I was much, much happier at Pacific Union College than yeah. I was at Avondale. Avondale was a much rougher, tougher, much more demanding, judgmental, uh, hardcore uh, approach to Adventism. California Adventism is primarily lifestyle Adventism. People are nice. Uh, I mean, I'd come to California and uh, people would listen to pop music in their cars. Like my dad had the attitude that pop music was of, of the devil. Uh, now, like the parents of my mates, they, they listen to pop music in their cars. Like in California Adventism, they'll serve coffee at official Adventist gatherings. Like the way I was raised, coffee was a tremendous sin. I mean, people would go to movies the way I was raised in Australian Adventism. You know, that's a huge sin. People would go to theater in the way I was raised in Australian Adventism, that was a huge sin. Uh, some people ate meat in the way I was raised in Australian Adventism, that was a huge sin. So the way that people used Adventism at Pacific Union College and uh, frequently in California was a much more easygoing, pleasant, liberal, um, accepting, you know, happy. People were happy. Like uh, mm. happiness is not the, the word that I would use to describe Avondale and, and the dominant ethos. Mm. People generally speaking, did not radiate happiness. There were some individuals who did, but you would not, I would not describe the Avondale Adventist community as happy. That's not the word yeah. that comes, comes to mind. Hardcore, serious, committed, argumentative, you know, brass tacks, ready to, to throw down and argue every little theological point, uh, ready to, you know, measure the skirts on, on some stranger you bring to church. If, if a skirt is, is a little too short, you know, we'll, we'll measure it out and we'll humiliate them right there. We'll humiliate you. We'll, 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 we'll destroy you if you go against any of our edicts. That was my experience of Avondale College. My experience of Pacific Union College was people who were happy, loving, reasonably tolerant, uh, just a completely different ethos from from Avondale. I much, much, much preferred the California version of Adventism, particularly mm -hmm. the Pacific Union College version of, of Adventism is a whole different thing. Anyway, I uh, finished, got mm. to finish eighth grade and uh, those final six months of eighth grade without my parents around were like the happiest six months of, of my life. All of my happy memories from childhood were far removed from my parents and I could get away from them 
then life suddenly opened up and I could be I could be normal. Uh, went back to Washington D.C. and uh, then we went off to Glacier View. And I approached it very much. I was still in the kind of uh, father worshiping, hero worshiping attitude towards my father, even if I didn't particularly enjoy his company. I, I saw him as a great man. I remember once I was playing this uh, baseball game, and uh, some friend of my friend's mother asked me, well, "Why don't you play this game that you love so much with your father?" It was a game with cards and dice and stuff. And I said, "Oh no, I, I would never do that. You know, my father is you know way too busy to you know play." you know, these kind of games with, with me. But yeah, I went to Glacier View. I was there. I remember, I think that the first uh, day I was there, I jumped in the pool and this, uh, I think Seventh-day Adventist administrator or academic said, who are you? And I said, I'm the son of the man you're burning at the stake. So I had a very self-righteous, um, <laughs> very much, you know, my dad's been victimized and I'm being yeah. victimized uh, along with it. And so I went to all the meetings and it was, in a sense, it was kind of cool to see my father was the focus of attention. It was it was amazing to see how emotional people were getting. This was like their whole life was on the line here. Uh, Neil Wilson was seemed like a very astute administrator. He, he seemed to really know what he was doing. He he kind of had everything uh, under control, no matter what happened. It was just uh, people were just uh, playing their roles. But uh, Neil Wilson already had it all turned out uh, there was a tremendous amount of love and passion and intensity in the air one uh, supporter of my father's came to the cabin and said that if i ever wanted to study medicine he, he'd pay my my tuition i'd never had any intention of uh, studying medicine wow. but it just shows the tremendous intensity and passion and and generosity of the people there so it was kind of an exciting period it was uh, in, over the previous six months i decided i wanted to be a journalist when i grew up so I was hoping that there'd be journalists there. There weren't any journalists there. Uh, but I was very eager to hear about my father talking to journalists after the event from Newsweek, from the Los Angeles Times. I, I'd hear about all these different journalists who were interviewing my father. And so I was, I was very interested in that. But uh, when, when I realized we were never coming back to Pacific Union College, that was just an absolutely sickening blow. I was afraid that we would move to England and my father would pastor a church there. That seemed to be in the mix. Uh, when we ended up about two and a half hours drive from Pacific Union College in uh, Auburn, California, north of Sacramento, uh, that was acceptable to me, but it was very, very lonely because we now outside the, the warm bosom of the church. We we're no longer living on an Adventist college community. And so it, it was quite an adjustment. I failed two classes my freshman year, my ninth grade first time in my life that I'd failed classes uh, so I, I was breaking out in highs I had this huge problem with highs so the, the aftermath of, of Glacier View was was awful for me it was pretty tough on, on my father as, as well I, I really missed Pacific Union College I would get back there every opportunity that I could it's interesting the um, conversation I had with William Johnson, uh, who would have been one of the big uh, names that was at Glacier View as well, he, in the interview we did a few weeks ago, he speaks very highly of PUC as well. And uh, most most Adventists I talk to that have had the PUC experience um, comment how different it is to Adventism in other places around the world. And, yeah, I think uh, I read something William Johnson wrote about my father after he died, and I thought it was, it was pretty accurate. Right, right. Do you recall what it was? Uh, one thing, uh, <clears throat> I, I'll try to, try to pull, it, pull it up, but uh, he, said, he said that uh, my father was, was uh, yeah, William G. Johnson. Yeah, he, he, he wrote, I, I thought it was one of the best pieces about my, my father because I could understand where he's coming from, and it seemed like the most honest and full-hearted. Like, when people are speaking honestly, you feel the molecules in the air around you change. And so mm. what, what William Johnson wrote, it seemed to come completely from a pure place, and he was just writing from his heart and, and from from the perspective of, of his experience. He wrote, uh, a Des Ford died, and I weep, I weep for Des, and I weep for my church uh, because no reconciliation came about. So my father 
you know, devoted his whole life to the church, but you could also equally say that my father devoted himself to destroying the church. I don't have an argument either way that people want to see it. You know, I don't care. Like, obviously, I'm a convert to Orthodox Judaism. You know, the well-being of the Seventh-day Adventist church is not my concern. But I have empathy for people for whom the church is their life. And for someone like William Johnson, the church is, is their life. And I thought that he had a very accurate understanding of my father and how my, how, how my father worked. And he also, of course, loved his church. And he also noted there was never a reconciliation between the church and my father. And my father would have played, you know, at least 50% of that, that, uh, my father would rather die than admit to being wrong. So, for example, for decades, people would tell my father that he had sleep apnea. And my father could never hear suggestions like that. It's like, no, 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 no. And then after about four decades of being told that he had sleep apnea, and this is primary reason why he couldn't sleep, he finally goes in and gets a test. And it shows he doesn't just have sleep apnea. He has severe sleep apnea. So this is devastating because my father has maintained for decades that he doesn't have it. Now, not only does he have it, he has it severely. So the way to deal with that is by using a CPAP. But if my father was to use a CPAP and to have his life transformed by that, he would have to deal with the agony of being wrong for all those decades. So my father would rather die than admit to being wrong. So very quickly, it's like, oh, no, I can't deal with this CPAP. He would rather die than admit to being wrong. And uh, this isn't a criticism of my father. There are many wonderful qualities that come with this kind of dedication to, to truth. Mm. So I think my father's final testimony, uh, which, which was so quintessential of him, like when, when he was facing death, when he had you know, nothing left, he, he dictated his final testimony. And his final testimony, testimony was that he'd only ever pursued theological truth. And he dedicated his whole life to theological truth. And he'd never compromise in his dedication to theological truth. And he'd only ever taught theological truth. Now, I understand that. I respect that. To me, it's the most ludicrous thing in the world, that there is no theological truth because all theology depends upon a subjective leap of faith. But to my father in, in his dying, dying, you know, dying days, that's the most important thing, that he wanted people to know that he was right and that he dedicated his whole life to being right, and uh, he'd sacrificed everything to being right about something as incredibly subjective as theological truth. But that's what, what, dedicated, that's what my father dedicated his life to. The, the, the idea of being wrong was absolutely intolerable for him. He would, he would rather die than ever admit to being wrong. Was he in pursuit of theological right and wrong or was he in pursuit of understanding theology like oh, my for father example was in pursuit he... of being right my right. father was in pursuit of being right in, in everything but particularly theology because that's remember that's where he got the most adulation so if my father was right about politics that wouldn't produce you know a lot of adulation but here's the paragraph from william johnson that really uh, hit me des ford is an australian tragedy he can't begin to grasp the dynamics of his love-hate relationship with the Adventist church without factoring in the culture. Australian culture lacks niceties, nuances, subtleties. Theology and politics reduce issues to distinctions of black and white. Australians tend to be suspicious of shades of gray. Election campaigns are a no-holds-barred slam, bang, brawl, lasting only a short time. Des Ford was a child of the culture, both temperamentally and environmentally. His proclamation, whether oral or written, fell naturally into a debate, into either-or mode. His clear proclamation of the gospel helped thousands to find peace and hope. Inevitably, it generated concerned brethren who bitterly opposed him. So he was an, an Adventist tragedy, the man of charisma, unmatched in debate. Could not Adventism have found a place to accommodate his many gifts? Uh, the author says he kept waiting and praying that there'd be reconciliation. Des needed it. So did the church. But uh, there was never going to be uh, reconciliation. The blame doesn't lie wholly with church leaders reconciliation requires action from both sides des was so sure that he was right that he made reconciliation very difficult so this is true between my father and seventh-day adventist church it was true between my father and his sons uh my father could not deal with the possibility of of him being wrong 
if you um, look at that, did you, were you aware of the was it the the consensus was it the twenty point consensus document? <laughs> There's so many documents in the Adventist Church um, where he did agree to to go along with that, which would have meant he would have had to say, well, okay, well, I'll I'll live. Uh, will agree to disagree, but I can live with that. Um, when Neil Wilson apparently realised that your dad was happy to kind of compromise there, um, he brought in other information and that was released as the 10-point document. <laughs> and had, I think it had been further drilled down onto some of the key points that he knew your dad would never back down on. Do, are you aware of those two? Yeah, doc- vaguely, what but this is just like, like you know the arguments between husband and wife about you know why didn't you get the type of milk that I wanted from from the store? Like what what these arguments you know ten points twenty points what they're ostensibly about is not what they're really about. When people argue, it's never about what they're arguing about. Just like people's problems are never their problems. Mm. I'm smart enough, and you're smart enough that if our problems were our problems, we'd solve them. But our problems are not our problems. Our problems are symptoms of things that we don't want to deal with. And and so we complain about the problem, but the problem's not the problem. And so, you know, 10 points, 20 points, you know, seven points here, signing this, you know, whatever the perspective is, you know, fun, you know, it all comes down to ego and to group dynamics. Every group has to stand for something. The Seventh-day Adventist stands for, they have a distinctive message that was, you know, revealed by by divine revelation through Ellen White. And uh, if the Adventist church was to give up their heavenly sanctuary doctrine, they would no longer have be God's chosen people. So there's no way the Seventh-day Adventist church can compromise with what my father declared uh, publicly. And my father can never compromise with what he declared publicly because once he did that, the attention directed his way increased 50 times. And so... Mm-hmm. Uh, for for someone like my father, who due to a combination of genes and environment, you know, this fed him because he could not, you know, get normal human interaction and and enjoy it. He he had to get interaction for for being the preacher man. He he's suddenly getting you know a fifty fold increase in what he most wants, and so he's not going to back away from from that. The church can't back away from its distinctive teachings. So it, it is a, a tragedy. It's a tragedy of you know, a combination of genes, environment, uh, group dynamics, and then you know whatever someone may believe about free will. I guess I raised those two documents, though, to indicate that he was willing to kind of compromise and change to a degree on those initial points that were raised. But when Neil drilled down and made it more specific, yeah, he definitely didn't want to back down on those ones. He was never going to back down on anything that uh, interfered with his own perception as someone who always put theological truth uh, number one. So people, for example, people won't steal at work to an unlimited degree or steal generally. People only steal to the degree that they can still think of themselves as a good person. So, you know, if I just take this, I'm still a good person. But if I take that, I'm not a good person. So my father was never going to compromise anything that would uh, interfere with his self-image as someone who puts theological truth first. Because okay. that's, that's the whole basis of his meaning in life. Um, you mentioned the sanctuary and how Adventists um, will not shift on certain things. I've found it quite frustrating in some of the interviews and in some of my conversations with people. I'm trying to work out what do Adventists currently believe <laughs> is the sanctuary doctrine. Uh, back in those days, when you were young, but obviously very, a very good observer and very astute, were you um, aware of the difference of what your dad's vision of the sanctuary was and what the church's teaching of the sanctuary was, just out of interest? Yeah, probably. But but you know, the, the people get hung up on on, on the details of you know of, of theology. What it what it really amounts to is, do you believe that you're group especially chosen by God. If you're religious and you don't believe your group especially chosen by God, you're not going to have any enthusiasm for, for your group. So it, whether or not you understand all the particulars or the different ways that it, it's framed, that's what it always comes down to. Do you believe that your church is the 
the final, most accurate expression of God's will for humanity. If you believe that, then you've got to accept. You know, you can't certainly go can't go public uh, defaming the the heavenly sanctuary doctrine. So, do you believe right. that your group is specially chosen by God? That's what it comes down to. It and all the other details that they're just like arguing. Oh, you got the wrong brand of milk from the store. Yeah. Regardless of how your dad got to these positions of not wanting to change on it, um, regardless of the cards he'd been dealt that that formed his um, story and 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 um, responses and cause and effect reactions, um, that new teaching of the sanctuary brought lots and lots of um, joy and freedom to people um, what do you what are your thoughts on that and do you see that as a as a good thing well if you stop uh, hitting yourself over a head with a hammer that's going to bring lots of joy and freedom but you'll notice you know the, these tens of thousands of people who found lots of joy and freedom through taking on uh, my father's approach to, to the heavenly sanctuary doctrine, that their children by and large don't feel it, all right? It's not something that can be passed on down the generations. There's no sustaining of this feeling. This is just a feeling. You, you don't build right. any institutions or anything on it. So yeah, if you're beating yourself up, you know, like you talked a little bit in your, your childhood, you're a bit worried about, uh, you know, the end of time and, the, and uh, yeah, yeah, being judged by God and stuff like that. So if you're, if you're beating yourself up, through the own, through the peculiar combination of your personality and the teachings of the church, and that results in you beating yourself down, and then someone comes along and says you don't need to beat yourself down, everything's going to be great, then you're going to love that, and you're going to welcome that, and you're going to be filled with you know peace, joy, and love everlasting. But it, mm. it's not something that uh, sustains. Your children are not going to be filled with you know love, peace, and joy everlasting, or certainly not their children. What's happened is that you simply yeah. ceased beating yourself down and when you cease beating yourself down then you naturally get filled with love joy and peace everlasting but i mean that would be true for a million different things like if you've always beaten yourself down for having a stutter or if you've always beaten yourself down because you disappointed your parents or if you've always beaten yourself down because you're not as successful as your mates when you stop beating yourself down you're going to feel a lot of peace love and joy I, I I think for me that's that's the next step to realize that ultimately it's your own abilities and choices and awarenesses and changes and um, and moves that you make in life to to stop getting beaten down to remove the hammer yourself. But there there's a significant moment where someone can point out that the hammer is hitting you on the head and that there are other options. So you don't. That doesn't necessarily open the path. Thank you, Des, for doing that. Now my life will become someone that follows your teachings. But he he did a massive um, shake up for people, where a lot of people suddenly went, "Hang on, I am being hit over the head with a hammer." And then a lot of them, a lot of them kind of went on to become the Fordites, and a lot of them went on to go, "Okay, well, I actually don't really believe what he's saying, but boy, I'm glad he shook me out of that." Um, you had that experience in some ways with Dennis Prager, where he kind of in some ways gave you a, a new paradigm uh, shift to be able to look at life. Uh, is there value in people like your dad that come along and help shake things up a bit, regardless of of their flaws and um, faults? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like... Uh... I mean, there's value and there's uh, whatever the opposite of value. So for people who feel like their church was destroyed by my father, I, I understand where they're coming from, from people who feel like uh, their life was liberated by my father. I, I understand where they're coming from too. Now, also, there are hundreds of thousands of Adventists who held to the heavenly sanctuary doctrine to whatever extent they understood it, and, and they lived uh, completely happy lives. Like they weren't uh, tormented. So it wasn't just the heavenly sanctuary doctrine that was beating people down. It was the heavenly sanctuary doctrine in combination with a particular personality type that was beating themselves down. And then my father came along, you know, shook things up. So when you shake things up, uh, you know, there are going to be winners and losers. 
so I have, I have as much empathy for the for the losers as I do for for the winners in that particular interaction. I I feel no need to beat my father down for his choices, nor do I feel any need to uh, praise him. He uh, he shook the tree and he paid the price and he did the time. He did the crime. He did the time. Mm, mm. Do do you find any irony in that you you went from one um, belief modality that felt that they were the chosen people to another that claimed to be the chosen people? I, I don't know about irony, but I think I, I grew up with uh, living in high intensity religion. And so Seventh day Adventism is high intensity religion when compared to, say, mainstream Protestantism or pretty much any other version of Protestantism. Adventism is high intensity. And so that's what was normal for me and so i found in, in judaism judaism of the orthodox variety was a similar level of high intensity and uh i i need that i i like that i'm i'm wired that way and uh it uh it works for me but i i don't i don't feel the need to you know tell tell you that oh you you need to become jewish you need to start studying <laughs> maimonides you need mm. to, you know, give up all this Christian stuff and embrace the the, the Torah and and mm. you know, have you have you read read some Hasidic wisdom lately? No. Yeah. <laughs> one one thing I like about um, the, the the Jewish friends I have um, is there's never any proselytizing. It's like it's not even on their table. They, they, in fact, when you were talking about before, you could talk to. Um, your, your Jewish friends about atheism or theism and it was quite comfortable. A lot of my Jewish friends actually never talk about God as an existing supernatural being even. Yeah. Yeah, Christians and, and Jews talk very differently about God. For, for Jews, God, familiarity with God breeds contempt. So because in part because Christians talk about God so much, Jews almost never talk about God because it just feels so Christian. Uh, so, so the, 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 the Jewish way of life is primarily centered around actions and, and practices, while the, the Christian way of life is, Christians approach belief in God as an either-or proposition. You either believe or you don't believe. Uh, <laughs> for Jews, however, familiarity uh, breeds contempt. So even among Orthodox Jews, there isn't, there's very little discussion of theology. Uh, mm. Very, very little discussion of, of God. In fact, I had to, had to go to twelve-step programs before I started getting that that vibrant talk about God again in my life. Mm. The, the the and I love all that. That's fantastic. I, it concerns me that that at some point um, these modalities and religions do have a unique us and them scenario that they like to put forward. Is that does that worry you, and is it okay because you're kind of in the group, and so it it doesn't, you're, and you're feeling really accepted by the group? Um, does it matter? No, it doesn't worry me at all because reality does not worry me, and reality is that we only care about in groups. Like for for everyone right. who says, "Oh, I care so much about those out groups," like. You know, I, I was born and raised Seventh Day Adventist, but you know, I really love the Jews and I love the Muzzies and you know, I love the people in Africa and I really care about the people in China. It's uh, either you know, it's conscious or unconscious delusion. We're all inherently speaking, selfish. <laughs> nobody cares about out groups, all right? Australians don't care about what happens outside of Australia, with very rare exceptions. Americans don't give a toss, generally speaking, about what happens outside of America. Guess what? The Chinese don't care about the non-Chinese. The Japanese don't care about the non-Japanese. By and large, Jews don't care about non-Jews. By and large, <laughs> Christians don't care about non-Christians. It's not even yeah. just Christians. Seventh-day Adventists, generally speaking, only care about Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. And that's how it is. Black people care about black people. White people care about white people. Uh, Japanese only care about Japanese. The, the exceptions are so rare and so inconsequential that it's not even worth uh, talking about. Nobody cares about our groups. That's the reality. We're born into a tribe. 
We're born into a group. Mm. It's unnatural and rare and inconsequential to care about our groups. We all naturally see the world through in-group versus out-group uh, glasses. And, and that's mm. just how it is. And to try to escape from that is to try to escape from reality. It's like, hey, mm. the laws of gravity, they no longer apply to me. You know, I care about everyone. You know, I'm just going to jump off this cliff. Doesn't work. Yeah, we're all um, we're all selfish, <laughs> and I think not only that, we all find a lot of comfort with being in an in group, and that's why a lot of people, when they leave a group, they find it very difficult. Yeah, you feel absolutely lost because you're 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 wired to belong to a tribe. That's mm, how so you're should, wired. You're, you're should, wired to uh, care about a tribe so and should nobody have I, else. Should I have stayed within Adventism and? Uh, made it work then uh it's, it's a little more challenging with adventism because there's that great movie the nostradamus kid um yeah adventists are really good at sniffing out those who, who no longer believe <laughs> essentially sending them on their way so it's a bit of a challenge i mean if if you have a personality type where you don't talk to you know people about you know that you don't believe in this and it, it also depends on the community so Avondale, as I recall, it was not a community where you could, uh, you know, not believe and, and still still get along. But in the final analysis, like whether I believed or don't believe in Orthodox Judaism, I'm in the tribe for life. You know, whatever my feelings or beliefs, you know, wax and wane on a day is completely irrelevant. I'm committed because most of my friends are Orthodox Jews. That's where my human connection is. We're wired to belong to an to an in-group and those who, who say live their whole life in Adventism, like I, I assume you did, and it sounds mm -hmm. like you, you've left it, you're going to be so bereft. I mean, mm. you can tell yourself, oh, you know, I did the brave thing. I did the, the thing that has integrity. I did the, the courageous thing. I, I followed my conscience. I, I have, you know, these 17 rational reasons for, for my, you know, choice. But you're yeah. going to be like an infant. Who, uh, you're going to be like an orphan who isn't touched. Like you're going to yeah. miss out on that. You know that vital connection that comes from belonging in a tribe. You're going to be like the ape who gets kicked out of his ape group, and he goes wandering. You know how long do you think an ape mm. who, who's expelled from his group? How long do you think the ape's going to make it? You know now his his connections are just those who oh. share you know certain activities with him. Uh, I mean, it we, sucks to, to be on the outside and not to belong to an in-group. Yeah, I, uh, I hear you, and they're the things that, that I've faced, and I think that's why I've um, explored so much a variety of connections with friends that I've made over the years who I connect with, and they are from many different groups tribes and umbrellas um, one of the good things about music and traveling with music over the years and not just being an Adventist musician um, you know I was very much making a living in the secular world is that I have built up you know how you can go out to dinner with someone and they, they might be from one community and you, there's three or four people in that group you just get on with and then there's a, another group of Adventists over here and you hang out with them and there's a two or three in that group you get on with. I feel like I've got two or three people from lots of little groups that are, are becoming um, my tribe but we're not gathered together under an, an umbrella and, and I think a lot of people that leave a tribe yearn for um, that sense of camaraderie that you've found with um the with judaism orthodox judaism yeah yeah we're we're, we're wired yeah. to connect yeah i like it maybe if you'd stayed in puc um your things would have been totally different you might have been found that as your tribe and worked within it and, and stayed connected yeah yeah absolutely you know yeah. we're, we're wired to connect if i had like if I had landed a Sheila at uh, PUC, like uh, mates of mine, they, 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 they met their Sheila by eighth grade. That was the only Sheila they were ever with for the rest of their lives. They, they married her after uni and, you know, on their way. Do you think if I'd, if I'd uh, met my Sheila in, in eighth grade and uh, she and her family, they were, the church was very important to them, I think I would have blown all that up, you know, just to, to follow mm -hmm. my intellectual interests? You know, I, I don't think so. You've, you've found your new PUC. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And all, all of us, you know, through everything that we do in life, really, that's all, all we want to find is at home, I guess. Yep. Yep. There was a and, book that my stepmother would often uh, dip into. And I've never read the book, but I've never forgotten the title by Paul Tournier, a Christian psychologist. And the title was A Place for You. We all want a place to mm. feel that's you know at home where we have safety and we have uh, connection. And and regardless of your thoughts and feelings on your dad, um, because you have a blend of, of positive feelings with, with um, different shades there, um, he also yearned for that feeling. And in many ways, he, he found it in a way because... Um, I noticed when I booked him to do a talk for me maybe four years ago now, maybe more, I'm not too sure, um, the people that arrived to hear him speak that day, I realized that they were a tribe. They were, they had uh, gathered around your dad's teachings, the drama of the defrocking, the, and, and I noticed more than anything that they them over lunch the way they got on with each other <laughs> and i actually yearned I, I thought boy i wish i was part of that tribe um so he kind of was able to live in a in a in a, in a way where he had that camaraderie that maybe you didn't find till recently uh yeah yeah he he did have a, a community and and uh, he helped to build a community and uh I, I did get to experience it because that's what I, I grew up in. I was 14 when we left the church. Then he, he went out and uh, started started a community. And so I, I got to to be a part of it, but it was a pale imitation of the real thing. Yeah. I mean, I look across to, like, Avondale. We've got College Church, Avondale College. We've got the Memorial Church. And they're two separate tribes, really. And I look across at the... Um, the memorial guys and those that were the we called the concerned brethren, you know, and they would meet uh, regularly around at George Burnside's place, and they had a community and a tribe. And I've sometimes looked across um, at them as well and thought, boy, I wish I had that too. So um, there's there's pockets of Adventism where they all find this kind of thing, but like you said, they soon uh, can sense if you're someone that's not fully believing in. Uh, the uh, dictates of the tribe's uh, <laughs> um, beliefs, I guess, their dogma. And and so in many ways, both sides I've felt um, at times alienated from. And um, Yeah, you, you want to live in the middle of the herd. So that's one of the sayings in 12-step programs, like live in the middle of the herd. People after a meeting are going to dinner, go to dinner. Like live in the middle of the group. Don't don't stand off to the side. Yeah, yeah. Um, mate, we've covered some ground today. <laughs> I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to to us. Um, have you got anything else that you? No, mate, like I'm good. Add per, any other pearls of wisdom we've left out? Uh, I. Mean, I, I made notes as we spoke uh yeah when when people are at ease with themselves they make us feel at ease so that's that's you can usually tell when people are at ease with themselves we like to be around people who are at uh, at ease with themselves and uh, i remember one thing i learned in uh, 12 step programs is uh, never give people advice more than once so if you think that people should read a certain book just say it once and then let it go you think people uh -huh. should try a certain diet, just uh, say it once and uh, then let it go. Okay, don't that's have, it. Don't I'm harp good. on it. <laughs> yeah. Mate, uh, well, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you very much um, and for contributing and adding to this document that we, we're uh, putting out there for, for better or worse. Yeah, you're welcome, mate. Um, yeah, thank you. We'll uh, talk again soon. Okay, cheers, mate. Take care.